This morning's lesson, last one in the series on the 23rd Psalm, A Place for Me. Now, as I sat down to study over this lesson and get all my thoughts together, I uh, had a few more thoughts than I anticipated. So this introduction here may be a little longer than average. It may be average, I don't know. But when I saw that, a place for me, as far as the 23rd Psalm, what David had in mind was a singular place when he wrote the words, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In the houses of the Lord, and not in a house of the Lord, but in the house. The is an article that indicates singular. Now I have a question. How many official Jewish temples were there in the Old Testament at any given time? One. 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 Yes. I think everybody knows that. First there was the, uh, the tabernacle in the wilderness. Then Solomon built his temple, which was destroyed by the, by the Babylonians. Then Herod the Great built the temple, which was destroyed by the Romans in, in AD 70. Each of these played an important part in the history of Israel, but during their time, they were the only acceptable place to offer sacrifice to God. And one of the greatest failures of the Jews was their unwillingness to be satisfied with a single place of worship, with a single point of contact. We read in Ezekiel 16, uh, chap verses 20, 31 and 32, Thou buildest thine imminent place in the head of every way, and makest thine high place in every street, and hast not been as a harlot in that thou scornest higher, but as a wife that committeth adultery, which taketh strangers instead of her husband. And also in Jeremiah 11 and 13 we read, For according to the number of thy cities were thy gods, O Judah, and according to the number of thy, the streets of Jerusalem have you set up altars. In, this, in all this, no matter what they did, they always claimed faithfulness to the one true God. They always believed that they were faithful. They were blind to the fact that they had surrendered themselves to a multitude of ungodly ways. When the prophets warned them of their behavior, they lashed out and killed them for their faithfulness to God. The prophets were concerned for the well-being of their people. They, they took the Word of God seriously. They were concerned for the spiritual benefit of their people. And yet when they told them the truth, uh, Jesus Himself said, you beat some, you stone some. But they killed most of them. If they were sincere in seeking God's will, the Jewish nation saw to it that they were put to death because they believed themselves correct in the multitude of failures. They believed themselves faithful no matter how faithless they had become. Now, is it any wonder today when people question the unified nature of God's one fold? We're no different. The, the human race, the, the so-called Christian world is no different today. Just as in the Old Testament, generations have been brought up to believe that the multitude of organizations is perfectly a part of God's will. It was never God's will that we be divided. It was always God's will that we, we, we be unified. That, that's the entirety of the Old Testament. We see that the unity drew the people closer to God. But their division separated them from their God. The mindset, this mindset is thoroughly ingrained in the modern Christianity of today. Now, it's our responsibility to allow the Spirit to work through us, through God's Word, to help others understand that throughout the Bible, this division has always been a ploy of the enemy of our souls. It's always been His desire to divide us. It, it, if He can divide individuals within a single congregation, He's one. 
If he can divide organizations, he's won. If he can divide the people of God in any way, shape, or form, he's won. That's what he's here for. He's here to divide and conquer. We, the sooner we understand that as a Christian, as a group of Christians, as the kingdom of God, the sooner we understand that, the sooner we can come to the place where we can bless one another instead of being opposed one to another. Now this division was already firmly established in the Jewish nation during the time of Christ. Uh, we often don't notice that. But that's exactly why we read about the Pharisees and the Sadducees. These were the most prominent of a large number of divisions which had already taken place in the nation of, of uh, in the Jewish nation at this time. The Pharisees believed in a strict adherence to the law without any concern for the spirit with which it was given. It had become an outward show of piety with their hearts remaining unchanged and full of sinful thoughts and intentions in the, in the, uh, as motivations for the things which they did. The Sadducees, on the other hand, they believed that the spirit and the body were separate and therefore there was no need to obey the law, but simply enjoy life to the fullest because they were the chosen people of God. That made them holy simply being the chosen people of God. All the while doing these things, they believed their souls were clean because God is merciful. Does, does any of that sound familiar to, to the, the world of, of so-called Christianity today? That those divisions in, in the mindsets of individuals, they're both wrong. The Pharisees were wrong just as wrong as the Sadducees were wrong. They both believed that they were right. This is a clear representation of the legalistic and the libertarian viewpoints among the religious individuals in our modern world today. They spend so much time arguing about who is right and which way is best that they fail to realize all of them have fallen short of God's will. Satan loves to drive wedges wherever he can. His dissension is the opposite of harmony. God would have us all to be one in our understanding of His will since His will is unique. God doesn't have separate wills for you and me. Division will never inherit unity. <clears throat> As I was thinking about this this morning, I, I woke up and I, I thought about the fact that God's will for each of us may be different. God has chosen for me to be a Sunday school teacher. He, he's told for you to be a pastor. He's chosen for you to be a pastor, Sunday school superintendent, CPMA leader, uh, VLB leader, WMB leader. We have different roles within the confines of the church. Even beyond that, there are some of us who are, who are called to use our ministry of singing. There are some who are called to use the ministry of music. Some are particularly good at outreach and, and being a blessing to, to, to those who are hurting. Those, there are those who can console the, the hurting. There are those who can strengthen the weak. It's, these are things that God has implanted within our being. But beyond that, our goal, and I'm not talking about just at this local church, I'm not just talking about in the church of God, our goal in the kingdom of God should be to win the lost and be unified and come together, not be driven apart, not be separated. God's will, although, may, although it may vary between us, His will does not vary when it comes to His word. God will not say, okay, for you, drinking is a sin. For you, drinking is okay. God will not say, for you, adultery is a sin. For you, adultery is okay. That's division. Amen. That's not unity. There are so, and I, first things that come to the top of my head, I'm not pointing anybody out. I'm just stating this is, this is the mindset that people have, that, it's, that these things are acceptable. It's okay that you believe that this is wrong, and I believe that this is okay. That's division. That's not unity. God has called us to unity of purpose. A unity of purpose cannot be divided. 
That makes it not unity. If it's division, it can't be unity. There cannot be unity in diversity. Not in that way. Diversity, uh, okay, I'm a Sunday school teacher, you're a pastor, you're a VLB leader. That kind of diversity is acceptable because it's within the confines of God's will and God's Word. But God's will for what is sin and what is not sin does not vary. It cannot vary by the very concept of having a Bible. If we have the Word of God, it should be clear as to what is right and what is wrong. It is. There can't be any variation to say, well, I, I believe most of the Bible, but this part doesn't work. That's not unity. The only way we as individuals, we as, as the kingdom of God, uh, they're, they're, uh, Brother Ammons used to talk about people who spoke of the kingdom of God as being outside. And, and we're the church. But they're the kingdom, we're the church. And he'd say, no. At first, you've got to be a part of the kingdom before you can become a part of the church. We are kingdom saints here today. And as the kingdom, as the entire group of saved individuals in the world, it should be our desire to find the perfect will of God and not to be divided amongst ourselves. This is what happened to the Jews. And what happened? Jesus came and told them they were all wrong. What would Jesus do if He came to this earth today? Would he say, yeah, you're all right, everything's good? Or would he speak to us, and I'm talking about us, the same way that he spoke to the Jews? Because we're failing to live up to the fullness of the will of God. We're failing to seek that unity. We're failing to desire to reach out to the lost, not only to the lost, but to reach out to those who may have some confusion about the Word of God. This is our responsibility just as much. Our responsibility is to unify the body of Christ and make it a place for me. The church. Not the churches. Not a church among many varied churches. The church that God would have us to be. Ephesians chapter 4, verses 4-6. through 6, There is one body and one spirit, even as you are called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. This being the case, once again, how can there be found unity in diversity? One, that, that seems to be a pretty common, commonly repeated word in this passage of Scripture. And, and I think it's on purpose. I think it's necessary that we understand that one is the number of God. There is number of the Trinity. One is the number that God would have us to be. There is no number greater than one that the church should be divided into. One. There is one place of safety. There is one body, Paul says. One body. Not a multitude of bodies sharing the same head, but one body. Amos 3 and 3. How, I'm sorry, Amos 3 and 3, can two walk together except they be agreed? Paul understood the, uh, the importance of absolute unity and not compromise disguised as unity. Ephesians 1 and 10, that in the dispensation of the fullness of times, he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in Him. Gather together in one. All <laughs> things in Christ. One is not divisible by any other whole number. It is singular and unique. This hardly describes the state of the modern so-called Christian world. 1 Corinthians 12, 12 and 13. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all the members of the bo that body, that one body being many, are one body, so also is Christ. For by one Spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one Spirit. A singular body works together and with a unified purpose. 
Now this could possibly describe many individual organizations, but it cannot describe an association of many different organizations with differing ideas and opposing viewpoints. If that, if that were to describe a single body, then no positive progress could ever be made since part of the body would be trying to do some things that would make it impossible for other parts of that same body to cooperate. Now there are diseases which can cause a body, a human body, similar difficulties. As I was thinking about this, Parkinson's disease and mus muscular sclerosis came to mind. Things where you can't, you can't do the things that you want to do because your body doesn't cooperate with your brain. What benefit is that in the church world? What benefit is it if God is telling us to react in a particular way and part of the body wants to act this way and part of the body wants to act that way? That's not a place of safety. This is not the body that Paul is describing. Ephesians 4, 11 through 16, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up into Him in all things which is the head, even Christ, from which the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working of the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Now, here we have a good description of what God's perfect body will look like. That place of safety David was speaking of. In Acts 4, 32 through 35, and the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own, but they had all things common. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. Neither was there any among them that lacked. For as many as, ha as were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the prices of the things that were sold and laid them down at the apostles' feet. And distribution was made unto every man according as he had need. This is the one fold and how it will operate in its perfection. This is a far cry from this, this unity that we see all around us today. We are promised one fold but it's up to us as individuals to be fully submitted to God so that His will can come to pass through us. If I'm fully submitted to God and you're fully submitted to God, there will be no division among us. If there is division, then one of three things is so. Either you're not fully submitted to God, or I'm not fully submitted to God, or neither of us are fully submitted to God. There cannot be unity until there is full submission to the Good Shepherd. Only then will that unity be seen in us. We're going to have differences of opinion. I don't like the red carpet in here. My, my opinion was overridden by the rest of the church. I don't care. It hasn't hurt me one bit to have this color carpet in the church. It doesn't matter. It doesn't affect my spiritual well-being. The, the chairs are not my perfectly favorite color. I don't care. That opinion does not bear any weight on my soul. Was I pleased with the choice? No. Am I going to let it destroy me and I'm going to go make my own church where I can have blue pews and blue carpet? Well, no. That's stupid. That's ridiculous but such are the divisions that are among the people of God today. It doesn't have to be something so serious as a biblical doctrine. Simple differences of opinion divide individuals. 
But when we're fully submitted to the will of God, those mean nothing. Those bear no weight. Those, those have no impact on our lives. But the things of God, those are the things which are critical to our, our unity, to, to finding that place of safety, a place for me. Getting into the lesson now. As studied in the lesson 8 of this quarter, the kingdom of God is made up of all born-again believers in Christ Jesus. They are His true sheep. It is a spiritual kingdom that cannot be seen with our eyes. The kingdom of God and the church of God are two distinct and separate entities with certain relationships to each other. The scripture bears this out. The devil has used man to twist the word of God in an attempt to make the two appear sorry, appear the same or interchangeable. But Jesus told the church, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now here Jesus was speaking to the church. Now, something cannot be given to itself. You can't receive something that you already are. Hey, Nick, I'm going to give you Nick. Doesn't work. He's already Nick. He can't be Nick. He, I can't give him something that he already is. But here Jesus says to the little flock, his church, the small group that he's wanting to give them, it's, his, it's the Father's will for them to have the entirety of the kingdom. When studied out, Jesus makes it clear that the kingdom and the church are quite distinct as, as entities. The kingdom is promised to the church. But the kingdom and church are not the same. Golden Truth, Psalms 23 and 6. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Part 1, a place for me. One fold. Part A, the sheepfold. John 10 and 16. One of my favorite verses. And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice, and there shall be one fold and one shepherd. The words of Jesus here make it clear that the kingdom and the church are separate. There are many saved individuals who have not yet become part of the church. Otherwise, this verse doesn't make any sense. Jesus calls them sheep and not goats. And while there are certainly goats who have yet to become His sheep, there are currently sheep who will soon become members of God's one fold. Now, I can't get past the fact that Jesus says there will be one fold and not a multitude of folds. There, there will be one fold and one shepherd. There is, I'm sorry, there is one way and not a multitude of ways to be saved. Only one. There's only one Spirit that draws us to the foot of the cross. There's only one God. And Peter said there's only, or Paul said there's only one body. It's God's will for there only to be one church and not a multitude of organizations with differing opinions, ideas, and opposing doctrines. How can opposition engender unity? There's no way that opposition can engender unity. A minister once gave this example, and some may recognize the minister. If you tie two cats together by the tail and throw them over the clothesline, you will have a unit, but you will not have unity. Is, is that not an apt description of the so-called Christian world today? They're, try, they're trying the uni, unity and diversity tactic that doesn't make any sense. And, and meanwhile, they're fighting, this is right, that's right, this is right, that's right. And both of them believe that they're right and they're both wrong. We can't tie ourselves uh, together with those who clearly violate the Word of God and call it unity. In order for us to be unified, the only unity that we should have should be unity in Christ. Unity in our understanding of the Word of God. 
unity in the singular truth. There's only one truth. You can't have multiple truths. The world, world would like us to believe that there are multiple versions of the truth. Your idea of the truth may be different from my idea of the truth, and that's fine because we're different people and, and we have different truths. No. Gravity works the same for all of us. Some may have to, to, to struggle more with gravity than others, but gravity works the same with all of us. It keeps us on the ground. That's a truth. There aren't any variations on that truth. You can, you, can, you can claim variations on the truth of gravity. You can claim variations on the, the direction of the, the blowing wind. It doesn't change anything. But those two cats, that's the best that unity and diversity can hope for. But God's plan will bring peace and harmony. As the sun sets and darkness begins to settle, the shepherd leads his sheep into the fold. The sheepfold is often a large cave or enclosure providing shelter such as a, such a place was provided for the, for the birth of our Savior, the Lamb of God. As the sheep go into the fold, it is at this point when the shepherd usually counts and inspects them as they individually pass under his rod to enter into the fold. God not only has a, excuse me, a flock but He has prepared a special place of safety for them. This fold, the church of God, provides protection for the flock. In a world of religious confusion and chaos, it's often difficult to find absolute truth and genuine Christian love. Nevertheless, the Word of God promises a haven of safety from the erroneous teachings of the world. Both the Old Testament and New Testament support this. Jeremiah 23, 1-4 Woe be unto the pastors that destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, saith the Lord. I'll pause right there for a moment. And the, <clears throat> is this not precisely what the denominational world is doing today? By their words and through their ministries, they divide people into opposing factions who cannot tolerate each other's ideas. This is clearly not the unified body that Paul was speaking of, nor is it the one fold promised by Jesus. This can only be the work of the one who would have none of us to ever see eye to eye on any topic of discussion. Back into the scripture here. Therefore, thus saith the Lord of God, the Lord God of Israel, against the pastors that feed my people. Ye have scattered my flock and driven them away and have not visited them. Behold, I will visit upon you the evil of your doing, saith the Lord. And I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all countries whither I have driven them and will bring them again to their folds and they shall be fruitful and increase. And I will set up shepherds over them which shall feed them and they shall fear no more nor be dismayed. Neither shall they be lacking, saith the Lord." Now the words of the prophet here can only be fulfilled by our absolute surrender to the Spirit of God. It's our only hope. <clears throat> when we lay aside our petty differences and agree that the Word of God is clear on God's will for His people, then we will begin to move toward the perfect unity which can only be found in God. Only be found in our full submission to the Spirit. When we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. We don't need the law. We don't need, we don't need doctrine if we're walking in the Spirit. The church of God does not need doctrine if her members walk in the Spirit. Because when we walk by the Spirit, we do the things of the Spirit. We don't allow ourselves to be submitted to the will of the flesh. Because it's only the will of the flesh that draws us to the things of the flesh. But when we're submitted to God, we will do those things that God expects us to do. We will avoid those things that God expects us to avoid. Because His Spirit's the one leading and not ourselves, not our own personal will, not our minds, not our ideas, not our personal opinions. When the Spirit leads, there is no error. There is no division. There's only unity. 
Through the power of the Holy Ghost, God will lead each one of His sheep to the safety and protection of the fold. John 10, 16 says, And other sheep I have which are not of this fold. Them also I must bring, and they shall hear my voice. And there shall be one fold and one shepherd. Now many fail to understand that we were created, each of us, we were created in the image of God. And many by their actions... They create their own new gods after their own thoughts and imaginations and ideas. Consider these following statements. My God doesn't condemn the guilty. My God teaches that homosexuality is a sin, but adultery, that's not a sin. My God says that smoking and drinking are fine, and I don't have to read the Bible or pray either. My God tells me to be sure I can judge everyone as harshly as I can so that others won't notice all my own personal faults. My God tells me to do whatever I want, but only on Tuesdays. That's just silliness. Every bit of this is just silliness. These are just a few of the many interesting ideas that people may have about God. The problem is, that each of them claim to be serving the same God. When in reality, each of these are gods made in the, in, in, in the image of the individual who created that God to suit their own personal choices and lifestyles. As a result, the number of denominations continue to grow as quickly as people can disagree about any new topic. Each one creates a new God that while loosely based on the Creator, does little to establish truth and a lot to increase division. This was never God's will for humanity. Jeremiah 50 and 5 helped explain how this will happen. How we will come to that one fold. They shall ask their way to Zion with their faces thitherward, saying, Come, and let us join ourselves to the Lord in a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. Now, recently, I, I've been watching some, some interesting videos on YouTube. Individuals, a uh, Hebrew scholar, and gets deep into the Word. And covenant love is something that he's uh, covered recently. I think I, I spoke on it briefly not long ago. But that covenant love, we, when we think of love... We think of a feeling, an emotion. But when the Bible speaks of a covenant, there, there's no feeling involved. It's a choice that we make. I, when, when Wendy and I, uh, May 27, 1995, when she walked down the aisle and we stood in front of that, that minister, her uncle, we chose that no matter what happened from that day forward, we were going to do the best that we could to benefit one another. It wasn't, there were no uh, loopholes in that agreement that we made. The single loophole, if you die, Wendy, I might get married. If I die, you might get married. That was the only loophole in the agreement that we made. And, and, and the, everybody knows the marriage covenant. Better or worse, sickness and health, richer or poorer. What, what we're saying is, I promise that no matter what happens between now and the end of my life, I'm going to do everything I can to make your life better. And it doesn't matter what you do to me. It doesn't matter how you treat me. It doesn't matter what you do. I'm going to do that because this is a promise that I'm making. There's no way out of that because I've chosen. I've chosen you for life. I chose my wife for life. And it doesn't matter how she treats me. It doesn't matter if I come home and she whacks me in the head with a frying pan every time I come home from work. It doesn't matter if, if she goes out and cheats on me with different people every day of the week. It doesn't matter if she chooses to completely leave the church and go crazy and do whatever she wants and never come and see me and never allow me to see her. I have chosen her. 
That covenant that I took was a choice that I made, that I made for life. And here, the Bible speaks of a perpetual covenant that shall not be forgotten. Like I said, there is that one loophole in, in my marriage to Wendy. If she dies, I have the freedom to get married again. But this covenant that the Bible speaks of here in Jeremiah is a perpetual covenant. I have chosen to serve God no matter what it is that He requires of me. No matter how hard those choices might be. No matter how much against my opinion His Word may seem. I have chosen to serve Him. And what that requires of me is to do those things that He expects of me. And if I walk in the Spirit, I won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. God not only requires us to do the things that He expects of us, but He gives us the power through His Spirit to fulfill that. One of the biggest problems we have specifically in this country is our understanding of the word love. Once again, as I said not long ago, we, we feel like love is an emotion. It's, it's a feeling. Well, I feel hungry right now. But in about an hour and 20 minutes, I'm not going to feel hungry anymore. I, f I feel like I love my, my wife right now. But what about tomorrow? What about when she does whack me upside the head with a frying pan? What about if she does go out and cheat on me? What about if she does the other the, emotions gonna arise decide? Too. <laughs> what, if, what if those things? That, that's not a, it, love can't be a feeling. And if you look at the Word of God and you study it out, you see that love is far more than that. It's a choice that we make. It, love is an action that's seen in our lives. How can, how can Wendy tell that I love her? Because I'd say, I love you 500 times a day, does that make her certain that I love her? Or is it by the things that I do? Is it, is it the, the little things, well, I know if I do this for Wendy right now, she's not here and able to take care of this. I know if she were here, she would want this taken care of. I'm going to go ahead and do this because I know that that will make her happy. That's love. I know that if, if I do this, it's going to upset Wendy, but I really want to do this. But, you know, I love her so much. I'm not going to do that because I don't want to upset her. That's action. That's what love is. Love is not, well, I do. Love is not saying the words, I do. Love is what happens for the rest of your life after that. And if we say, I do to God, then we'll do whatever it is. We'll, we'll make those concessions. <laughs> God, I really want to do this. God says, no. Okay. My happiness is found in pleasing the Lord, not pleasing myself. If my happiness is found in pleasing myself, I'm going to go ahead and do whatever I want. Well, then guess what? I am my own God. God is no longer my God. I am my God. But when I love the Lord as I should, it's my desire to please Him. When I love my wife as I should, it's my desire to do those things that make her happy. And that action is the love. That choice that I make to avoid the things that hurt her and do the things that please her that's love. I'm just going to go ahead and read some more notes here. None of us have the power in and of ourselves to live up to, to God's expectations. But it's only by our submission to Him that we have hope for eternity. As a result, we have absolutely no room to boast. That includes belittling others who may not have as clear a revelation. As the church, it's our responsibility to lift up and not to tear down. Now I'm talking about both inside the church and outside the church. We are called to open blinded eyes and help, the, help set those captives free. We are no better than others. Only God makes the difference. As we take the covenant, God inspects His sheep. He knows those who are truly His. Paul warned of vicious wolves who would enter into the fold after he died. While the kingdom is made up of all saved individuals, there is the possibility that wolves will enter into the fold. God 
can't be fooled. No one will enter the kingdom of God without the salvation granted by God. The church, or the fold on the other hand, runs the risk of allowing wolves to creep in since the entry is granted by men who cannot see into the hearts and the intentions of others. i read this verse from the part C, the porter. For the Son of Man is as a man taking a far journey who left his house and gave authority to his servants and to every man his work and commanded the porter to watch. Mark 13, 34. It's, this verse says, who left his house? Just in case there is any question as to the timing of the organization of the church, Jesus cleared that question up here. He could not leave his house if it had not yet been built. Jesus also said in Matthew 16, 18, I will build my church. Not the Holy Ghost, not the Father, but Jesus Himself. Also consider what God said to David when he had decided that he wanted to build the temple. 2 Samuel 2, 7, 12, and 13, And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. And he shall build an house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Now, this was clearly pointing to Solomon, who would eventually build the temple, the physical temple, but it's also a prophecy of the coming Messiah who would come to establish the church while he was among his people. Solomon died, but Jesus' throne has been established forever. He is the eternal reigning King of kings and Lord of lords. <clears throat> Acts 20 and 28. There's, um, Take heed therefore unto yourselves and to the flock over the which the Holy Ghost hath made you overseers to feed the church of God which he hath purchased which is with his own blood. Not only did Jesus lay down his life for the sheep, his precious blood was the purchase price for his church. He clearly established her with the 12 charter members on the mountain in Mark 3 verses 13 through 15. Even at this early time, Jesus called out the twelve from the multitude of those who followed Him. The word translated as church in the New Testament actually means those who are called out. Called out from what? Out from the multitudes who are already following Jesus. This precisely mirrors the kingdom and the church today. Many follow Jesus, but only a relatively few have been called out from among them to be a part of the church. This must not become a point of pride. Membership is a privilege, and our responsibility is to help others come to a fuller knowledge of the truth so that they can join us in reaching out to help lift up the lost. Salvation is for peace and joy, not pride and oppression. Pride and oppression are tactics of our common adversary and will never be found being used by those who are truly submitted to God's will. i got a, almost a minute left. See what i got. Mm. Okay. Very end, in the conclusion. 23rd Psalm is a poem describing all that we should look forward to in God's care. The words describe beautifully what God wants for each of us. Psalm 23, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for His name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for Thou art with me. Thy rod and Thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. As beautiful as those words are, the depth of meaning may escape some. As such, the author has taken upon herself to reword this psalm less poetically and more clearly for our benefit. This is Pretty much the, the author's rewording of the 23rd Psalm. We have a personal relationship with the Creator of all things. He supplies all our needs. He gives us rest. He provides peace and living water to satisfy our thirsty souls. He strengthens us 
He is our strength. He goes before us as our guide along this holy path. And even as we walk through low places, dealing with things such as trials tribulation, and tribulations, there is nothing to fear while Jesus is by our sides. He supplies us with discipline and correction to keep us moving in the right direction. He is our protection in all things. He sent us the Comforter, the Holy Ghost. He feeds our souls. Through Him, we have continued protection and the assurance of the restoration of for the lost. He heals us. God's miraculous blessings are abundant and spill from us onto others. His goodness and His mercy pursue us. He has provided the fold, a place of safety here on earth, and we also have the hope of eternal life with Him. What wonderful things God has prepared for those who love Him.